Let's talk about today 10 considerations before getting a puppy. 10 things that are important for people to consider before they take on this really important decision, as I just got a new puppy, right? Considerations that everybody needs to make uh, to keep in mind because it is a long-term commitment and it's crucial that you're ready to provide the necessary care and time committed and you have the resources to meet their needs. We talk a lot about when I get my clients ready for taking their puppy home, we do a virtual visit and I spend about an hour um, talking about what that first year in general, amongst many other things, but that first year is really should be built on building this relationship, training through expectation. It's not just trick training, teaching your dog to sit, stay, come. It's really about appropriate manners, um, oh, true, true obedience, that innate connection, true respect, honoring your dog, um, and the amount of time and commitment that truly does take. We, we tend to, I have seen, we tend to just automatically expect a puppy to know where to go to the bathroom, what to chew on, what not to chew on, not to jump on people. Why is this dog pulling on the leash? Why is this dog reactive? Why is this dog not saying, or why is this dog not sitting when I tell it to sit when I took it to the park when you've never practiced that before? Um, my book's coming out soon, Raising the Empowered Puppy, and I talk a lot about the three Ds of training, proofing, and truly building this relationship um, for setting you up for success for a lifetime together that's respectful and polite. And, uh, and it, there, if you're constantly, there's this constant friction of trying to get your dog to quote unquote behave, you're not gonna have that relationship that you, you, you may so desire with your dog. So, but let's talk about some important considerations before you decide is this the time to bring home a dog or a puppy? And that will be, I'm gonna kind of talk about at the end, one of the, there, there's three things that's some a little controversial, right? There's gonna be the, do you adopt, do you shop? Um, do you take on a puppy or a, an older dog? Uh, are, are two other things to think about, but let's hammer through 10 things before you think about that. Um, are you ready to bring home a dog or a puppy? Let's, let's just say a puppy. Number one, time and commitment. Dogs require daily care, exercise, training, time, and attention. And if you are really busy, I mean, I think, I think this more than anything, this consideration, um, keeps people from getting a dog. You know, they're like, we're really busy right now. Like we're at work all the time and we have other obligations and other responsibilities and we just don't have the time it takes to devote to, to, to devote to our dog's needs. And I think this is a really uh, important consideration. I think far too often people take home a dog and they truly don't have the time it takes. And that is a, a huge reason why so many dogs are rehomed. All right, number two, financial responsibility. Dogs do come with various expenses and it does depend on the breed. Golden Doodles, for example, come with a hefty grooming bill. Um, other dogs have health issues, uh, other considerations and concerns as well. So do your research, but in general, all dogs need veterinary care. All dogs need grooming to some extent. Um, all dogs need high quality food. All dogs need appropriate treats and bones and mental stimulation, which those things can and do cost money. Dogs do need collars and leashes and training tools, uh, treat bags, poop bags, all of their gear and equipment, regardless if it's just a pet or a working dog, there are necessary items that a dog does need. So, it, it, and then there's just ongoing veterinary care. And if a dog does get sick or hurt, you know, are you covered? I highly, highly recommend dog insurance for anybody considering getting a dog. Number three, space and living arrangements. Consider the size of your space and the dog that you want to make sure it's suitable for uh, where you're living. If you live in a very small space, you may want to do a smaller dog. I will say, however, I don't think this is an end all be all. I've seen people live in very small spaces and have a large dog. Some large breed dogs are very lazy. Um, and with 
daily walks, even several times a day. They don't need a big yard. They don't need a big house. And so just research the breed and your lifestyle and your time and commitment. And you may be able to have a large breed dog in a small, small space. Um, some small breeds have a lot of energy as well. And so if you don't have a yard, it could still prove to be difficult. So really evaluate what is the living space. If you don't have a yard, do you have, this goes back to the time and the commitment to potty train in an apartment. It, it is more difficult. It does take more time. You do have to get up in the middle of the night initially and take your puppy all the way outside. It's not like opening your back door. So just things to consider. Number four, breed and temperament. We talk a lot about this at 4E Kennels. Giving a puppy's a voice in their placement, truly choosing a puppy based on temperament so that it does fit your lifestyle. But before even that, is choosing the breed. What was this breed bred to do? Like I just introduced to you Asgard, our new farm dog, uh, an LSD, a, a life, uh, life stock dog. They are bred to protect the property, protect te technically sheep and goats, um, cattle. Ours protect our people, our dogs, our cats, our peacocks. We have goats and chickens and horses <laughs> and uh, farm dog protects and watches over everything on property. He knows who should be here, who shouldn't be here, and he will do whatever it is willing to take to protect his farm. Um, and so these dogs were bred to do that. Some dogs were bred to herd like border collies and healers. And then people buy them and they get upset because the healers chasing and nipping at their kids' heels. Well, that's what the dog was literally bred to do. So really strongly consider what was this dog bred to do? Understand the history and the origin of um, the innate breed and, and what breeders have done to to uh, get them to what they are and how they function and work in our society. So understand that activity level, assertiveness, their innate job that they're supposed to do. Huskies were bred to pull sleds and cover miles and miles and miles a day. And yet we get frustrated because they take off out the front door and people get like, this dang dog is untrainable and he takes off and I can't find him for days. Well, He's, he's literally needing to satiate the need of covering some miles every day. So like me personally, I would never own a Husky. I love them. I think they're amazing. I'm fascinated by them. I have a great respect for them, but I personally could never meet their needs. I could never meet their innate needs of the amount of exercise they need um, and in trying to honor their desire to pull as well and trying to set something up for them to be able to practice pulling things and, and be able to really use their innate skills to do the job that they were bred to do, which is just fascinating. I personally could never take that on. Um, and then you have to consider as well with breed and temperament, we'll talk a little bit about this. Do you want a puppy versus an adult dog? Do you have the time and patience uh, to train a puppy versus a, an adult dog? But do understand if you do get an adult dog, there could be behavior issues that do come with that dog. That the longer a dog is allowed to do something or once a, a negative behavior has been established and allowed, it may be almost impossible to very difficult to change that pattern. Uh, and so that's just something to keep in mind and why so many people are and have had negative experiences with rescue dogs um, because there was a negative behavior pattern and they weren't able to to change that or, or fix that. So, um, you know, there's always considerations, pros and cons to everything. Puppies are difficult too when you've got the, the, the responsibility, the weight of raising a well-balanced um, good citizen dog as well. And so that, that can't be taken lightly either. All right, number five, training and socialization. <clears throat> Dogs need training to learn not only basic obedience, but just proper behavior in general, uh, innate manners, what's allowed, what's not allowed. We all want dogs that function beautifully around anybody, any situation, neutral. We don't want dogs over threshold, over excited, over aggressive, um, over fearful. We want neutral dogs that can step into any situation 
in our human society and be okay. Um, and so do you have the time to do training and socialization with a puppy specifically for sure? Number six, lifestyle changes. Owning a dog can significantly impact your daily routine. And are you willing to make those changes? I talk to my clients a lot when they're sitting and trying to pick between two puppies. This tends to be one of the things that we have to hash out a lot and look at pros and cons because first of all, there's no perfect puppy. I want to normalize and I wish I could get rid of the statement perfect puppy because there is no such thing. There's, there's a much better match, a much better option for you, a much better fit for you, but there's no perfect person. There's no perfect child. There's no perfect baby. There's no perfect puppy. They're, they all have pros and cons. They all have obstacle traits and desirable traits for you and your lifestyle. So it's breaking that down and looking to see what am I willing to, which puppy am I willing to take? What obstacle traits am I willing to manage and handle? One of those is for some people, some people like this, this is what's what's so incredible about this, for what's an obstacle trait to you may be desired for somebody else. For me, an obstacle trait is high energy. I don't want a high energy dog. I don't have the ability or the time or the desire or the energy to meet the higher energy level dog's needs. Some people want that. They need that. And so that to them is a desirable trait. For me, that would be an obstacle trait. So looking at uh, those traits and your lifestyle, so we talk about if you did take home this puppy with higher energy, are you willing to make some lifestyle changes? Are you willing to get up an hour earlier to walk and play and train? Are you willing to give up uh, going out to dinner after work or going to the movies after work or spending your weekends out for a while because that puppy does if you're working all day and especially a higher energy puppy needs the rest of your time for the most part they really do and so are you willing to make those lifestyle changes so really look and see um, what are you willing to do ensure that you're prepared for these changes and willing to prioritize prioritize your dog's needs at the end of the day and that's really what it comes down to to, again, to train and cultivate a happy, balanced dog. Number seven, allergies and health concerns. We're talking about health concerns in your family. If anybody in your family has health concerns, disabilities, um, I, I, I do see a lot. This has become you know, I'm just going to be really honest here. It's become a very difficult thing for me through our Healing Hearts program where we see ch children, um, especially children, but, but adults as well, that have poor health or battling cancer or have MS or have other diseases that have truly impacted their life and their ability to even care for themselves. They're not able to care for the dog. And I know that some families are really trying to advocate like, you know, this family member needs a dog. And our first, our first question, our first priority has to be, well, who's going to be caring for the dog? Who's going to meeting the dog's needs? Who's going to be able to bend over and pick up things off the floor, feed the dog, groom the dog, take the dog to appointments, pick up the dog if need be, uh, put him in the bathtub, all those kind of considerations when you're looking at um, any disabilities or any health concerns within the family. That is something that has to be considered. And for parents as well, I've come across a lot of parents they've just, and, and I just admire them so much for trying to find one more thing to help their, their child, especially if there's countless, spending countless nights and days in hospitals that they really feel like a dog can change and uplift their child's spirit, which it can, and we know that. We've seen the true power of a dog. But what I also have to be the manager of, basically, is am I placing this dog that will create too much of a burden for the parents that are already caring for this child? And um, I've made mistakes in doing that. I've placed dogs where it was. It became too much of a burden and mom's just kind of, it was just too much. Um, of course, we take the dogs back, but it is something to think about. We get caught up in, and you know, this is for everybody to think about. And especially with our Healing Hearts program, when you nominate somebody or if you think you want a dog too, and, and I know because I've done it too and I've seen it, 
we just think of all of the positive effects, the power of a dog, how nice it would be for my child or me to have a dog go while I'm going through all of this. Um, but what, what we forget to think about is it's still a dog. It's not a robot. They need continued training. They need their needs met in order to, uh, specifically speaking, our golden doodles come from working lines. Um, they need that constant uh, continued training, mental and physical stimulation. They need rules, boundaries, and limitations. They need that person that is able to provide for them as much or more as they're able to provide for you. And so finding that balance can be really tricky sometimes as much as it hurts our hearts to have to deny applications. Um, at the end of the day, I don't want, I never want my dog or a puppy to be a burden to a family, even if we all had the very best intentions going in. So think about allergies and health concerns for sure. That's one of our number one reasons why we do get puppies returned is allergies. There's no such thing as a hyperallergenic dog. There's not. There are dogs that do lend themselves better to those with allergies. Poodles is at the top of that. Um, so do your research. Golden noodles tend to lend themselves really nicely to those that do suffer with allergies, but it's not a guarantee and if it is a 50-50 golden doodle, half poodle, half golden retriever, for example, you're only getting half of the poodle. Um, so there could be potential problems still. So I always suggest that people spend some time around um, the, the breed they're thinking about and seeing how they do react with allergies. But also you have to think about, is it saliva versus dander? Because we've had a lot of people come to us and say, well, we have a saliva um, allergy. All I can say to that is teach a dog not to lick you <laughs> like at the end of the day. But shouldn't be too hard to manage. Don't let the dog lick you. Train that right away that that's not allowed. It's not rewarded. It's not something we do in this pack. We don't lick each other. Uh, keep your tongue to yourself. Keep it in your mouth. But uh, dander, there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, so please proceed carefully. It's, you know, and I know it's best intentions again, but it's from our point of view too, and the breeders that I mentor, once a puppy leaves our property, um, whether the, it's for one hour, whether it's for three weeks, they have to go back to the vet and go into isolation. And it really stinks because this is a really crucial time for puppy development. The first 16 weeks is the most crucial to their, their long-term development and, and, um, behavior. And so when we get that kind of delay where now they have to be in isolation at the vet, it, it can delay that. And so we, we definitely do not want that. So please, if you see, if you deal with allergies, please, please, you do your homework and make sure that you're, you feel pretty strongly that you're going to be okay bringing a dog into the family. And the reason why we have to put dogs in isolation is because I don't know where that dog's been. I don't know what that dog's been subjected to. And I have to protect my parents, my unvaccinated puppies and, up here because even something as simple as ear mites or lice would spread like wildfire. And then of course there's things that are um, deadly, parvo, distemper, K flu that could get brought up um, unwillingly, unknowingly. And so it, to protect all of our puppies, unfortunately, any return puppy has to go into isolation for a few days um, at the vet. All right. Number eight, Eight, long-term commitment. Dogs typically live 10 to 15 years, not long enough in my book. Can you make the long-term commitment? I know that life happens though and things change. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit that I really feel strongly that we need to normalize rehoming dogs and I'm going to explain why um, and how I think we're doing a detriment that it's become such a judged horrible thing to do. But overall, going into this, do you feel like you can make a long-term commitment? There are things that are out of our control. There are things that we cannot foresee, and that is just a part of life too. So I want to offer some grace, and I want to talk about this more on normalizing rehoming our dogs. Number nine, family and household dynamics. Do you have other pets? Do you have children? Do you have other people that live with you? Do they like dogs? Are they afraid of dogs? Do you have a dog aggressive dog that already lives in your home? These are considerations. Do not go to a breeder and ask for a puppy when you have a dog aggressive dog already in your home. If you have children or other considerations, Please research the breed and then work closely with your breeder to find the puppy that you think 
that and they think would be the best possible match for your family dynamics and your household dynamics. 10, legal and community restrictions. How many dogs are you allowed to have? What breeds are you allowed to have? Please check with where you live to make sure you can legally obtain a license for your dog um, in the county that you live or city area that you live. All right, that was number 10. There you go. I want to talk about the three things I have briefly mentioned that I think are important and that are not talked enough about because they are tricky, sticky subjects. The first is do you rescue or buy? Um, I think both are important and need to be done responsibly. If you rescue, do it responsibly. If you buy, do it responsibly. I think the number one thing you should ask a rescue group or a breeder is if this does not work, can I return the dog? If you cannot, that's an immediate no. That, that That's like the number one First way to find out if this is legit, if, this, if these are good meaning, well-intentioned people, regardless if they're breeders or uh, a rescue. So first thing you should ask, if I buy or rescue, can I return if this does not work out? Um, that needs to be the number one thing asked. <clears throat> to puppy or adult, we, we talked a little bit about that, you know, uh, do you prefer to raise your own puppy or do you want an older adult? There's pros and cons to both. Puppies can be difficult. They are very, very time consuming. You've got to potty train. You have to restrict some of their space. You have to puppy proof. You have to teach them everything. An adult dog, they sleep through the night. Hopefully they're kennel trained. Uh, but the cons can be with that is you don't know what you're getting all the time and you don't know the life experience this dog has had and you don't know if there's a pattern of a bad behavior that you will not be able to manage or handle. So that's always a little... Um, uh, you know, a, a little risky. And number three, I want to normalize that it is okay that people are not shamed about rehoming a dog if they can no longer provide and take care of and meet the needs of a dog. I have seen too many dogs suffer because people felt that they would get shamed or that they feel there's such a negative connotation with rehoming a dog that then this dog has been secluded, excluded, from the family, living outside 100% of the time, living in a kennel way too much, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and, and if a dog too, has too much energy and is too assertive and the, the family can't handle them, they're kind of banished and banned from the family. That's not good either. I would much rather please rehome that dog, find somebody that understands that dog's needs, find someone that can honor and respect and love and care for that dog in a way that you're not able to. Just man up, rehome. But as a society, we need to stop shaming and stop pointing fingers for people at rehoming a dog. And then sometimes just in life, unfortunately, circumstances happen. Um, things happen out of our control that we're no longer able to keep a dog. And I see it online all the time where people just absolutely go after um, each other. Now, I know there's a difference too. There are people that are getting rid of a dog after three days. I mean, that is ridiculous. There has been no commitment or um, true dedication to trying to make it work. But there have been people that have tried and tried and tried with true commitment and dedication and when it becomes that the dog suffers by being there mentally or physically, if the dog's needs are not being met, we need to put the dog first, find a family and a home that can meet their needs. Like what a difference it is. And I've seen it over and over and over again, a highly assertive, high energy dog and a family with little kids and the family works all the time and the dog's like tearing up the landscaping and tearing up this and tearing up that. So it's, it's been banished to the backyard and then banished in a kennel and has very little human interaction. And they think they're doing what's best because they're like, good God, like you can't rehome a dog. Everybody will cut my throat. Then I've seen that family find an active young couple that's hiking and, and can handle an assertive dog and is out running and super active. Take that same dog and that dog completely thrive and be loved and respected and honored. And what a blessing it was that they were rehomed. So let's normalize rehoming when done, when we've given it true commitment and true time to make it work. 
um, let's normalize rehoming. Whether you rescue or buy, whether it's a puppy or an adult, let's make sure we honor and respect our puppies first and foremost, and of course our dogs. I'm Jeanette with 4E Kennels. We're only healing hearts and changing lives through the power of a dog, but we're changing breeding from bad to badass. So we have over 6,000 breeders using my program here in the United States and internationally, Australia, Sweden, Finland. We have breeders all over using uh, my program. These are all breeders, as well as you watching, that truly believe in the power of a dog, honoring and respecting our dogs and valuing them for the truly just beautiful creatures that they are and what they've done to us. Our dogs deserve more. We need higher standards for breeding better education for breeders, but also better education for owners. Stay tuned. My book is coming out, Raising the Empowered Puppy. So everything that the empowered breeders do and all the education that I give to my clients will be given to all of you. Have a great day. Bye.